Hi, I'm Erin Silva, Associate Professor and State Extension Specialist in Organic Agriculture at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We're here today at the UW Arlington Ag Research Station, which is a 2,000 acre facility in southern Wisconsin, within which we have about 100 acres of certified organic land, where we do research on organic grains, including corn, soybeans, cereal grains, and alfalfa as a key part of the organic rotation. Within organic agriculture, building and maintaining soil health is a key principle and one of the guiding principles of the organic regulation. And cover crops are a key element for organic growers to be able to achieve successful building and maintaining of soil health and soil organic matter. Here in the northern part of the U.S., however, it can be a challenge to get cover crops in early enough in the fall to meaningfully put on biomass to achieve the benefits that we're hoping to achieve with respect to building soil organic matter, suppressing weeds, and adding to our soil fertility program. To be able to find opportunities to plant cover crops earlier, we've been doing research into interseeding. So looking at planting cover crops into standing corn before harvest to be able to get a jump on growth and be able to get more biomass in those cover crops where we can have those cover crops contribute to building soil organic matter and soil fertility. We've specifically looked at several cover crop species including annual ryegrass, tillage radish, other forage radishes, as well as red clover. Increasingly, we've been looking at more complex mixtures as well, including mixtures that include cowpeas and other legumes, including soybeans as a cover crop legume that do well in the heat of the summer and again, established successfully in that highly shaded environment under the corn canopy. We found varied results in this system through our five years of research. One of the challenges of interseeding into organic corn systems is our need for cultivation to manage weeds throughout the growing season. So it's been a balance with respect to when to plant the cover crops and how to manage weeds within the system. Typically, the recommendation we see with interseeding is to plant those cover crops around the V4, V5 stage, which in organic corn production systems typically corresponds well with our last in-row cultivation. So what we've typically been doing is to go in, cultivate our last cultivation like we normally would in organic corn systems, and follow right behind with a cover crop seeding, either through specialized interseeding equipment or through broadcast seeding into the corn canopy. However, in our systems in Wisconsin and in the Corn Belt, what we've typically seen is that that is too late within the growing season to get those cover crops successfully established. There is not enough light coming through the canopy of the corn to allow those cover crops to germinate and put on sufficient growth to carry them through the entire corn production season and to remain after the corn is harvested. So some of the newer strategies that we've been looking at to get those cover crops successfully established is to come in earlier in the corn production season, as well as changing our row spacing. So what we're ideally trying to do is to increase the time that sunlight is getting through the corn canopy and allowing those cover crops to successfully germinate and establish to carry growth through the corn production season and to have growth after the corn is harvested. So instead of coming in at the V4, V5 stage and the experiments behind me here, we've actually planted the cover crops at the V3 stage before canopy closure. So we're getting those cover crops in earlier. We have more sunlight coming through the, the corn canopy, but we are sacrificing the last cultivation of corn. So instead of cultivating the corn, we're relying more on rotary hoeing and then the weed suppression that's obtained by the cover crop canopy. So you can see as we walk into the field behind me that we do see sufficient growth on the cover crops as opposed to what we've seen in previous years where we've planted later. We can see cowpeas and tillage radish and some annual ryegrass that's established within the corn planted on 30 inch rows. The other technique we've been trying is wider row spacing. 
So there's a lot of interest in 60 inch corn, wide row corn, and the ability to come in between those wide rows and establish a cover crop that can either be used for soil building benefits or potentially grazing. And these 60 inch corn systems, we're not sacrificing our plant population. We're coming in and planting with a closer between plant spacing in the row. So we're still getting our overall target populations of about 32,000 plants per acre, but we're having them more densely spaced inside the row to be able to achieve that population. And then between those 60 inch corn rows, we're planting a cover crop. In the case of the experiments behind me, planting a forage soybean that again can either be used to add nitrogen, build our soil health, or potentially be grazed in the fall after the corn is removed. Farmers have used various approaches to get the cover crop seeded and established. Broadcast seeding is one of the easiest approaches, just coming in over the soil canopy and broadcasting either a single species or a mixture of species over the soil. While this can work, this is more dependent on getting rains at an appropriate time to ensure that that cover crop establishes. So it is a bit more high risk. There is some more specialized interseeding equipment that farmers are using, however, that allow for the establishment of cover crops even into an existing corn field. So using modified drills, where we're able to get two or three rows of cover crops between the corn established on 30 inch rows, or even coming through at some of the earlier stages with an unmodified drill and just going over the corn when it's still small at about the V1 stage. These are still experimental practices, however, where we need to have a lot more research and data, both on research stations and on farm to determine the feasibility of these approaches and the risks and benefits of these approaches of coming in early with different equipment and establishing the cover crop prior to when we'd be doing the last cultivation of organic corn. While interseeding is a practice that certainly could have benefits in organic grain production systems, it is also a practice that does come with some risk. So with respect to making recommendations of interseeding, the species of cover crops that tend to work the best include annual ryegrass, red clover, and, and tillage radish. Annual ryegrass, however, should be used with, with some caution in areas where annual ryegrass can overwinter because it can become a weed in certain circumstances in organic grain production systems where herbicides can't be used to terminate that cover crop. The other question I often ask farmers are what are they hoping to gain from the system? Are they looking to gain weed suppression? Are they looking to gain soil fertility? Are they looking to gain um, a, an additional field for grazing in the fall? And that can often guide decisions with respect to what cover crop to use and whether or not this practice is justified. There's a lot of excitement on the wide row corn system, the 60 inch corn system, on farms that do graze and do have an integration of livestock as that adds an additional opportunity for grazing into the fall, um, an additional way to get forage uh, within their organic grain production systems. A lot of the decisions with respect to what approach might be best for any specific farm really depends on the farm goals and how they're planning on utilizing that cover crop either through weed management, through building soil fertility or potentially grazing later on in the season. There is still a lot to learn with respect to the implementation of interseeding systems in the upper Midwest grain production systems that are managed organically and transitioning to organic production. Looking at new species of cover crops and optimizing the species of cover crops, looking at timing of cover crop planting and some of the new equipment that's now available to farmers are some of the things that we're looking at with respect to our research and the research we're conducting in partnership with farmers. Certainly the 60 inch corn system is something that potentially has a lot of promise, but again, looking at where that system is most appropriate, what are the plant populations, both of the cover crop and corn that we need to be targeting? And what are the trade-offs in terms of cover crop growth and corn yields, both as grain and as forage? So a lot of exciting new directions on the horizon, but a lot of need for research partnerships between farmers, crop consultants, and researchers to learn how to best optimize these practices for the organic grain production system. As we heard from Dr. Aaron Silva, 
Research in the area of corn interseeding is helping to provide recommendations for the best ways to begin the practice. There are also farmers who are currently practicing interseeding in corn. We caught up with James Schropfer of Sandy Plains Farm to better understand some of the benefits and challenges of interseeding in practice. So this is our silage cornfield again, and this was planted after alfalfa grass was terminated this spring. And so when the corn was a little bit above my knee, we interseeded a cover crop mix here of red clover, radish, rape, annual ryegrass, and winter rye. Um, several reasons. One, add diversity into the mix. Two, to capture any additional uh, sunlight, nutrients, water that's in excess of what the crop would need. And then three, since this corn is gonna be chopped off potentially end of September, Depending on weather and soil conditions, we could have upwards of a month yet where the soil would be still breaking down alfalfa residue from the previous crop of alfalfa. And that residue would have nitrogen that would come available and without anything green here to capture this after the silage, I could have potential loss in October, November timeframe. So in having the winter rye here and the annual rye grass, the radish and the rape, all later um, fall species that should grow into cooler conditions, I'm hoping to capture that end release later in the season where it's past what the silage corn is gonna use so I can carry that over to next year to the following crop. Other intention with this field is to leave then this green winter rye. The annual rye grass is gonna die off, the radish is gonna die off, but I will have some living cover here going through the winter into next spring before we terminate it prior to the next crop. So, it both breaks up the weed cycles because I'll have cover early spring. I'm not gonna have weeds germinating. The rye is gonna provide both suppression against weeds and it's also gonna provide that nitrogen carryover to the next crop. Interseeding is, is challenging in row crops uh, because you're, you're fighting with, if I seed it too early, any cover crop planted early like any other plant that takes it off will be competition to my corn crop. And at the end of the day, it's still my primary crop that's gonna pay my bills. So if I compromise that, I'm, you know, what can I afford to have a good cover crop establishment? The, uh, the flip side of that is if I tried to seed this too late, i.e. like right now where I have almost entire ground shaded out with the canopy and corn, I wouldn't have enough sunlight coming down here to get the cover crops started. So our goal in the year is to get the corn high enough where I'm going to be able to seed the cover crop and have about a week 10 days to two, two weeks of sunlight getting down underneath the canopy so I get a good establishment. And then once it canopies, it'll hold basically this cover crop in more of a dormant state until the corn doesn't need the sunlight anymore and starts browning down later in the season. So timing is very challenging on this. And the other factor that we have to look at is cover crops are still a crop. They're not a magical plant that grows under any condition. So I still need water in order for my cover crop to be successful. And in a drought here, like this year, we made the management decision of not putting seed on our dry land because we weren't getting any rain. Here I have an irrigator. I know I've got water. I know I can get the seed established and growing. So cover crops, like any other crops, still need water. They still need sunlight and they still need nutrients. And so you need to, if you want to be successful doing cover crops, you need to manage them as a crop. You just throw them into a field, that's how successful you're going to be. It's going to be a total crapshoot at the end of the year. Um, not leaving bare soil, I would say, <coughs> is part of weed management. Uh, but more importantly, what we find with cover crops is the reestablishment of good tilth of the soil. Uh, the value when it comes to next year, when, if, I, if I'm going to go to a row crop, let's say after this crop, uh, I have the ability with good tilth to do, um, have the dirt flow very well under cultivation. Let's say doing row cultivation, the dirt will flow into the row versus being clotty, chunky, and um, unmanageable in the, in the next season. Cover crops are just like children. If you let them, they will misbehave. And so like for this spring, um, and I don't know if we'll get to see that field or not, but we had uh, several winter rye cover crops prior to soybeans, for example. And on one of the fields, we made the management decision to terminate it early due to the dry conditions because I wanted to make sure there was adequate moisture for the soybean crop. The other rye cover crop we actually took ended up wanting and taking as a forage 
but if we were to look at that subsequent crop, <clears throat> the one where the rye was terminated early is bushed out. I have almost complete closure on the rows despite it being excessively dry. The one where I let the rye reach the boot stage and we cut it down for forage and then I planted soybeans, those soybean plants are only about eight, 10 inches tall right now. And so that again, those management to fix decisions on your cover crop is going to dictate how successful your crop is going to be. And you need to be somewhat flexible given the situations of the season if you're going to be successful with cover crops. So last year, this field would have been field corn and we have soybeans in it this year. Last year, this was sweet corn and we followed that with a winter rye crop and terminated the winter rye crop prior to planting the soybeans this year. And what I wanted to show here was the benefit of the cover crop in the rotation. Here, I mean, it's not bad, and the field is, was, was pretty clean, but we did end up walking it, and uh, we paid about 35 bucks an acre for walkers to get the escapes. Um, here, on the other hand, we had no escapes. Um, so when we look at the, what did that value of the cover crop, now granite and tilth and long-term organic matter and things of that nature, but just even economically now I can say, well, there's a $35 benefit here putting the rye prior to the soybeans, given that I didn't end up having to walk that, given the tilth of this ground being so much better, the dirt flowed well, the weeds we were able to terminate. Um, so just as a good visual, I wanted to demonstrate why we like to have that diversity in the rotation. It's not always the case that we fall with that much diversity, but when I can, I do. Um, obviously, I had fall tillage on both. Now, for the establishment of the cover crop here, that cover crop was broadcast and just incorporated with the regular fall tillage. So the only thing I had extra here was extra seed cost, and I had an extra pass with our spinner spreader to get it spread. So if you f I figure about five bucks an acre as far as the spreading cost uh, with the tractor and the spreader. And then um, from the, the winter rye standpoint, we planted a bushel and a half an acre. Uh, and last year we were selling our winter rye organically for about eight bucks. So it cost me about $12 worth of seed and five, five more dollars, so it comes to $17. Now this did require an extra tillage pass, of aggressive tillage pass, $15 an acre probably. So the, the point being, um, economically I'm probably roughly the same, but long term keeping my soil in, in good condition with good tilth, this is gonna help me stay ahead of weeds and keep that, that in organic management. And both of these fields will be seeded down to alfalfa next year, so we weren't overly concerned because I will have diversity back in here after a couple of years of row crops. But even so, I'd like to keep my soil in good tilth over the long term.